Examples of things that we talk about are life cycle, how long we want to be in the data center, the level of redundancy we're trying to achieve and our strategies for doing that. Obviously, energy efficiency, huge and important to every customer today. And growth capacity, how much growth do we need to have built into that data center infrastructure? So we, we really need to ensure that all of our stakeholders agree on this collective vision. And this is a challenging process because we all have different ideas. We understand our customer sites. We all have different ideas about how the data center should take shape, especially at this initial stage of the project. So it's really important that we take the time to do this. You know, a simple example might be that IT will say, we want the life cycle of the data center to be 15 years. And facilities will say, well, based on where that, the data center is going, we have expansion plans for that space in 10 years. You know, so it's clear that's a disconnect, but we need to understand all those things at the beginning of this process. And if we do that, if we share this vision for moving forward, then we can all buy into what we're trying to create before we really start going about designing the construction process. So we know who should be sitting at the table and why, and we know the process by which we all agree on what we're trying to create for the data center. The next thing is to move into a more detail-oriented part of the process, and that's the requirements collection phase. And the step of, of requirements collection really involves the, the stakeholders from the organization defining what they want and what they need for this data center to take shape. So we're going to break it down by what IT needs to bring to the table and what facilities need to bring to the table. And you'll start to see the, really the level of detail that we need and are looking for to create these customized designs. And we have to start with the IT side of the house because, as we all know, the, the IT equipment is the star of the show here. You know, the, inside the data center, that equipment is, is the lifeline of your organization. It runs your organization. So, and the changes in that equipment are what's driving these unique needs and the, the, the necessity for a different type of methodology to data center design. So we have to spend a lot of time with IT because it's a lot of detail that's required. But here's a critical step where we can involve our vendors. So no one, if anyone knows the equipment better than the customer, it's the people that built it. So we really encourage our customers to lean back on your vendors, similar to what the previous presenter referred to. Really lean back on your resources to help you understand and obtain this critical information as we go through the design process. So the, the detail that's required from the IT side really starts and ends with an equipment list. And it's, it's essentially an inventory, for lack of a better word. But it requires a lot of critical information about the systems that are installed in the data center that we're trying to create this customized design around. And the first step in that is just the make and model of all the systems that are in there. And that's storage and, and servers and switches and, and everything that's installed in the data center. We need to know what that is, make and model. And more important than that, probably the most critical thing that we need to know is the load in watts that corresponds to that piece of equipment. And that's distinctly different than the nameplate rating. You know, it's easy to go online and, and grab the spec off a piece of equipment and grab the nameplate rating, but we actually we can't design our data centers around those nameplate ratings. We have to be more specific and understand what the actual load is in watts that that piece of equipment consumes when it's running. So again, here's where you lean back on your vendors to help understand that information. Because sometimes it's not easily obtainable, but we have to go back to our vendors and help them understand, or help, help them help us understand what that critical information is. So we know the equipment, we know the load and loss. We also want to know the number of power supplies. And most of our customers are taking advantage of redundant power supply technology. Important information to have as part of this process and part of this list. And in addition to that, one step further is cord set requirements. Another thing that's very often overlooked, you know, in order to, to heat up that piece of equipment, we have to plug it in somewhere. And I'd be willing to bet that all the plugs inside the data center are not the same. And what we're trying to avoid down the road is surprises. If we overlook this and we realize once we start populating equipment that we don't have the right PDUs, we don't have the right cord plug capabilities inside of our, or at the rack level, then we have to change it at the end of the project. And we all know what that costs to change things after the fact. So we want to include this as part of the upfront requirements collection process. And we also want to include telecommunications connections. You know, another thing that varies, there's a large disparity between what equipment requires, especially at the server level or equipment level, from piece of equipment to piece of equipment. A Windows server might need one copper Cat6 connection and a SAN might need 24 LC duplex fiber optic connections. You know, it varies from each piece of equipment, and we need to make sure we understand that at this stage of the process so we don't under or oversize the rack connections from a fiber and, and copper level. 
We also just want to make note of non-standard equipment. And what we're trying to get the customer to do here is really you know, raise their hand as part of this process and identify things that might be a little bit outside of the norm. So when we talk about non-standard equipment or racking requirements, we're referring to stuff that is a little bit unique. Uh, example may be a tape library. A lot of tape libraries, they don't, they're not really the same shape as a standard telecommunications enclosure. They kind of sit off to the side in the data center a lot of times. So that's one good example of something that's not really standard. Or maybe you have a legacy piece of equipment that's still in production. It sits on a shelf inside of your, inside of your equipment rack. That is another good example of non-standard equipment. Again, we, we, we don't know any of this information without our customers' inputs. So we have to lean back on the customer and have them raise their hand or put a star next to some of the equipment on this equipment list so we understand that we might need to accommodate that equipment a little bit differently as part of the design. We also want them to make note of any unique infrastructure requirements. We talked about telecommunications and the disparity between the types of connections that are required at the rack level, but also power and cooling. You, know, you may have a blade enclosure that has its own power supply that has to be hardwired. So that's kind of a unique power requirement. Or maybe you have a switch that cools side to side instead of front to back. That's, that's also a little bit non-standard. So we just, again, no one knows that equipment like the customer. We need them to raise their hand, help us avoid those surprises after the fact, and make note of these unique requirements as part of this requirements collection process. And then the last thing we need from them is any miscellaneous real estate that's required. So it, it could be a variety of things, but you know, workspace inside the data center for workstations or you know, actual test benches or something like that for equipment. We need to know that information. Uh, if there's going to be a knock, you know, we're not, we're obviously not talking about the design of the knock today, but it takes up real estate, we need to know that information. And horizontal and backbone cabling, obviously something near and dear to everyone's heart in this room, and we heard about all the differences in the last presentation between the types and strategies of, of cabling inside the data center. So if you're going to support horizontal cabling from the data center, it obviously requires significant rack footprints. Regardless, what we're trying to understand is how much real estate is required to support those requirements. And that's all we really need from the IT's perspective at this stage of the game. So now that we understand that, we, we, we look at the facility sets. So we've collected these requirements from the IT side. We understand the technology requirements that we need. Now we need to understand how we can get infrastructure to support those requirements. And that's what we get from the facilities team. That's where we understand the infrastructure is available and what the associated capacities are of those infrastructures and how we support that equipment. So when we talk about infrastructure, we're talking about things like electrical. You know, is there enough power in the building to support the data center? And where is the closest source of power to the data center? Mechanical, if it's going to be a chilled water supported cooling system, do we have a chiller? Do we have enough existing capacity on that chiller to support the data center? Telecommunications, you know, another one, especially logistically from the facility side. Where are our entrance, where's our entrance facility? Where are our TRs? Are there any logistical challenges with making connections between those telecommunications spaces and the new data center? Emergency and backup power is another huge one. You know, do we have a generator on site, hopefully? And if we do, is there enough capacity to support the data center? Or do we want something dedicated? And if that's the case, where are we going to put it? Is it going to be on the roof? Is it going to be outside? How do we make those connections? Another critical one is fire suppression. You know, all of our customers, as we all know, want clean agent systems, and clean agent systems are fantastic. However, a lot of times, local jurisdictions or insurance requirements dictate that you actually need wet systems in your data center as well. And we've worked with a lot of customers that local code, codes will say, local jurisdictions will say, you have to have a wet system, no questions asked in your data center. And same thing on the insurance side. The insurance company will say, you know what, based on where this is installed in your building, you have to have a wet system. So if you want to go in and put a clean agent system on top of that, that's fantastic. But you are required to meet your insurance requirements, you have to have a wet system for fire suppression. So all important things to note at the beginning stages of the process and why it's critical to involve both these parties. Additionally, from facilities, we just need to understand room envelope things, like physical space. There are different strategies for how we're going to build a data center. Do we build the entire room to accommodate the growth now? Or do we build just what we need with the understanding that we can kind of blow out walls and move forward? So that's one way to do it. We need to understand their physical space needs. And we also just want generalized construction requirements. Are there demolition requirements? Do specific systems need to be brought up to code in order to make that space usable? We also need to think about floor loading. Obviously critical. We're talking about a 